So my wife, Brittany, and I uh, have been married a little bit over uh, nine years. We met when I moved to Atlanta a few, you know, a few years before that. I've lived in Atlanta for, I think, coming on 11 years. And when I first moved to Atlanta, a buddy of mine asked me to go play golf at a really nice golf course. And I was like, sure, I, I would love to go. And when I got there, I'm all like fired up about the golf match and seeing this beautiful course, meeting new friends in Atlanta. And he goes into the clubhouse and I'm kind of waiting outside and we're about to go tee off or go to the driving range. I'm not really sure what the plan was, but we, um, then he comes out and he, he tells me something and it just blew my mind. He was like, um, hey, and he had this stunned look on his face. He's like, Brad, you'll, you'll, you'll never believe it. Michael Jordan is here. He had gone into the clubhouse. He didn't see Michael Jordan, but he had heard from somebody else that Michael Jordan was at the golf course. We did not know where, but we knew something and we knew we had a chance that day to see Michael Jordan. And for me, I mean, it doesn't matter who you are, it's Michael Jordan, right? He's one of the greatest, if not the greatest. We won't get into that debate right now, but we could, right? Um, but for me, I grew up a massive Michael Jordan fan. I you know, sang the song a lot. I wanna be like Mike. If I could be like Mike, why not be? Okay, anyway, I had the cups from McDonald's for the 94 Dream Team. I had the poster. I wore the jersey. Michael Jordan was a big deal to me. And then now, here I am. He's on the golf course somewhere, somehow, and I've got the chance to see him, maybe even meet him, right? I, I could care less about anything else that day. I didn't care about shooting in the 70s. Okay, well, if you know anything about golf, that wasn't gonna be the case anyway. I didn't care about trying to break 100. I didn't care about the good time I was gonna have my friends. I had my mind set on one thing and one thing only, and that was meeting Michael Jordan. We didn't know where he was, so we just started looking. We started walking around. We started driving the cart around. Where is Michael? We go in the clubhouse, we go in the men's locker room. That was a little bit creepy, but we were just looking everywhere, right? Well, it turns out it didn't take us very long. We go to the driving range and there he is in the flesh, pretty close to me, but honestly not super close because everyone else knew that he was there. And so nobody was playing golf anymore. Everybody was just at the driving range. If you know anything about golf, there's different slots that you can practice, right? Well, Michael, or Mr. Jordan, sorry, he was at the very far end of the driving range as he should be getting a little protection, right? And I'm like, okay, sweet. But the only slot open was the exact opposite end. And so my dreams were click, quickly crashing down, right? And so I just like for 30 minutes, I just, just look for an opportunity way. And honestly, this is the most anticlimactic story, right? Because that's about as close as I got. And I just like hit golf balls, but you better believe the whole day. And even now, 10 years later, I'm saying I, I was close to Michael Jordan. Yes, my, I thought I was going to meet him. We were going to play golf together. He was going to like me so much. He was going to invite me into his foursome that day. But it's like, no, I was there, but I did, it, it was anticlimactic. I know. But here's the thing. I tell you that because that's not an unfamiliar scene in the New Testament. Because when Jesus showed up, this happened over and over again. There was something about this man. We're going to look at a story, right? That everyone wanted to see for themselves. They did everything they could to get close to hear, to understand, to know, to meet, to touch. They wanted to be around Jesus. This story is a familiar story. And what I'm, I'm hoping for today, because even if you know this story, I'm praying that there'll be a fresh revelation that comes, like it's come to me. This is one of my favorite stories in, the, in all of Scripture, but it's when there was a bunch of people trying to get close to Jesus. In Luke chapter five, verse 17, we'll start. You, you, you might know this story. One day, Jesus was teaching and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee, from Judea and Jerusalem, and the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. So you got the scene, right? He's in Capernaum. You can read this in Matthew and Mark as well. He's in Capernaum where a lot of his earthly ministry went down and he was in a house and the place was packed. You couldn't move. It wasn't socially distant. You couldn't even get in the front door because the crowd was so big because news had started traveling. Word had started spreading, right? And then it says there was also Pharisees and teachers of the law. That's important because as you, as you read Luke's account, right? This is the first mention of this group of people called Pharisees and then the teachers of the law. And what you'll begin to see as you read through Luke is this tension that was growing between the religious elite 
experts, if you will, if you will and this man named Jesus. And they were there not to hear and learn and receive and, and applaud and congratulate and say thank you and to put their trust in Jesus. No, most of them were there with a clipboard. They were there to evaluate. They were there to judge. They were there to discredit. They were there to say, no, you don't know what you're talking about. But in fact, Jesus knew everything he was talking about. I don't want you to miss this phrase either. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. What a beautiful phrase, but I also believe the same is true today. It is, right? The power of the Lord is here but through this broadcast, through this gathering, and he is ready to heal. And then this is a part that we know, verse 18. Some men carrying a paralyzed man on a mat, uh, some men came carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof, lowered him on his mat through the tiles in the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. Do you know this story? Have you heard it? Like I said, I've loved preaching it. I've loved thinking about me being one of the guys, one of these some men, right? If you look in Matthew and Mark, it says there's four guys and they were carrying a mat. And on this mat was a guy who couldn't walk, who couldn't control his body. He needed help getting to Jesus. And I'm like, come on, that's a beautiful picture of doing whatever it takes to get somebody to meet Jesus. But I, wanna, I want you and me, I want us to look even deeper, right? I want us to think about even that phrase, some men, these four guys, think about what they were doing. They were working, they were sacrificing, they were tired. They were doing whatever it took. They weren't taking no for an answer because they get to the house. Everybody's crowded around. They've got this guy they know needs to meet Jesus. They think Jesus can help them. And they're like, we got to get him there. But then the, the, nobody was making room. They couldn't get through the crowd. So they just were like, we'll, we'll go to an extraordinary effort. They climb up the stairs outside the house. They dig a little hole in the roof. And next thing you know, their bold faith just puts them, puts the guy right in front of Jesus. And I'm like, Come on, think about the some men and what they did to get their buddy to Jesus. I also uh, love thinking about the fact that they were caring for the marginalized. This man was paralyzed. If it weren't for these men, their friend might not have ever made it to Jesus, right? If you were paralyzed in this day and age, but also even right now, right? It's not a desirable condition. It's not a group of people the world longs to associate with. And especially in biblical times, it was actually a para, being paralyzed was a sign or was thought to be a result of sin in your life or a curse from God. But that didn't stop these four men from seeing a need, seeing a person that was marginalized by society and said, we can step in and help this man. We can get him to Jesus when he can't get there on his own. I love the effort of these men. And here's my question for you today. Are you one of those friends? Am I one of those friends? And do we have any of those friends in our life, right? I'll, there's a few other things. Look, let's keep reading. Verse 20, when Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. Read, read, read it again. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, friend, your sins are forgiven. When Jesus saw their faith, so a guy is about to get forgiveness of sins eternal life, right standing with Jesus. And it wasn't just because it was his faith, but the scripture says when Jesus saw their faith, plural, not individual. So something happens in this man's life because of the faith of his friendships, the faith of his community. I got a few points I wanna pull out today, but the first one is that everybody, as so we kick off this series called Everybody, Everybody needs a circle. Everybody, you and me, need to be in a circle like this guy was in a circle, right? He had people around him that were committed to him meeting Jesus. 
walking with Jesus, following Jesus, having an encounter with Jesus. Our, who we surround ourselves with is extremely important, right? The people that we're around the most are going to determine actually who we become because we're the product of who we surround ourselves with. You need a circle. Do you have a circle? Is it the right circle? Are you surrounded with people like these four guys? And are you somebody like these four guys for other people? Because this is the beautiful thing, right? This is the grace of God because he adopts us uh, through his grace as sons and daughters, right? But as sons and daughters, he places us in families and families are meant to operate with each other to help each other become all God wants us to become. And sure, we know families can get messy. It can get weird. There can, there's forgiveness, there's challenges, there's ups and downs, but a family nonetheless. And that's what we've been called to. And honestly, that's what we so desperately need. Salvation following Jesus isn't a solo sport. It's always been meant to be in the context of community. Even as you read the scriptures, right? Paul in the New Testament was writing to churches, not individuals. We, you, me need a circle to become the people that God wants us to become. So do you have the right circle? Are you in a circle? And, and this isn't, by the way, let's barricade ourselves off from the world, right? But it's actually making sure we're surrounded by people that can uh, help us be all that wants us, Jesus wants us to be. And then from those circles, we can go out, be sent out on mission to help the world meet Jesus. These guys were a circle. They were, they were helping this man become all that God wanted him to become. They were helping him have an encounter with Jesus. I need a circle, even as a pastor. I, there, there's moments and, and yes, this is for this man about salvation and healing, but there's moments for me that I feel like I'm the guy on the mat. And yes, I know Jesus. Yes, I'm helping lead the church, but there's discouragement. There's disappointment. There's anger. There's frustration, right? And, and to be honest, it gets a little bit awkward when my circle tells me that I, you know, quote scripture back to me to tell me to change the way I'm, you know, thinking, you know, it, it, as the pastor, I'm supposed to be one, you know, leading us to the prayer moments and leading us to think about Jesus. But typically it's even my wife when I'm like maybe stuck in bitterness or I'm holding a grudge or whatever, whatever. And she comes like and quotes some scripture to me. And I'm like, not now, babe, not now. I'm the pastor. Do you want to see my diploma, right? From seminary, where is yours? I'm going to be the one preaching to the, you know, to you today. But no, I, I need a circle. Because I, I can find myself on a mat, not in good shape in my faith. And I need people that will make sure they're helping me car carry me back to Jesus. We, we need each other. We don't need to give up on each other. We don't need to forsake each other. We don't need to push each other down. We need to do all we can for each other to help us become the people God wants us to become. Again, you need a circle. Are you in a circle? Are you in a, a context, even through Passion City Church? Our hope is not to just get, a, get the building back, build, building back open, Howard Theater back open, so we get everybody in a row. No, we want to do everything we can to come together as a, as a church to worship God together. But in that, we want to get you in a circle, a place where you can be known, where you can be connected. You could feel like, you know, people are there to encourage you, pray for you, support you, celebrate with you challenge you all the while helping you become the person God wants you to become. We don't want you to just sit in a row one day. We want you to be in a circle, but in that circle, you'll help invite other people into that same type of environment. Some men got their friend all the way to Jesus. I even uh, just ask, are you, are you, do you have the right voices in your life? Are, are, you, you might be in a circle, you might be in a, a friend group, but they're not pointing you to Jesus. They're not speaking up God's word over your life. They're not, you know, reminding you of who God is and what he's done and what he has is better than what the world offers. It might be the best thing that some of you do from this message is just reevaluate your circle. 
And I'm not saying you have to say, again, barricade yourself from the world. I don't have anything to do with you, but you just say, I need a group of people closely around me that will speak life, that will speak hope, that will speak scripture, that will speak following Jesus and not trying to pull me away to the things of this world. Some of you are like, man, I, I, I'm the guy on the mat. I can't help other people know Jesus because I don't know Jesus. I wanna know Jesus. I wanna be in the people of God, but I've got so many issues. Man, just a few weeks ago, I was talking to one of my friends and there's a, a guy we, that I knew of that he was intersecting with. And it, my, my buddy had this strong group of believers. And then there's this one guy that's going through a lot of hard times, not a Jesus follower, notorious, um, you know, not interested in faith kind of guy, right? But this group of friends, they slowly started inviting this other guy to come hang out with them. Come be around them. Come eat dinner with them. Come bring your kids to hang with this crew's kids and uh, come take trips with him. And what happened is slowly over time, this guy didn't have it all figured out, didn't have all the answers, right? But he had put himself around guys that he respected, that he wanted to be like. And I'm like giving major props to that guy that he, he saw a circle that, in, that just impressed him, that, that drew him in, that was something special about them. And he just, he put himself around Jesus people. And you know what happened over time? He became a Jesus guy. It's the, it's the power of circles. For me, it's an evangelism tactic. You're like, how do I lead my friends to Jesus? I'm like, well, we have a group of Christians that love Jesus, that are cool, that are normal, that uh, can operate in the world, not of the world. And then we'll just invite some other people that don't know Jesus to come hang out with us. A, a neighbor recently, we, I, I, he was new to, uh, new to our city and he was living uh, right across the street. One day I just knocked on his door. I was like, hey man, we have, we're having a cookout. Uh, some of my friends, he knew I was a pastor and that was the first weird conversation. This is now the second. I'm like, some of my friends from church are coming over. We're having a cookout. You want to come? The guy was like, uh, one, he was surprised I was knocking on his front door. But then he was like, man, that, that means a lot. I was like, does that mean you're coming? And he was like, yeah, it mean, means a lot. I was like, see you at five? Uh, wait, wait. It, it was honestly so easy because... Then everybody showed up. People were nice to him. They weren't all like, oh, that guy doesn't go to church. That guy doesn't know Jesus. It was just like friends. And he, by the end of the night, this guy was organizing the hang for this circle, right? Like, when are we all going to eat? When are we all going to hang out? And he even started referencing the fact that he was going to be the wayward member of Passion City Church. And I'm like, you don't even know Jesus yet. I haven't even invited you to church yet. And now you're even telling people you're coming. I'm like, it honestly can be so easy, right? because we live in a lonely world and people are longing for that. And as the church, as we find a circle, then we can help invite other people in to this beautiful thing called community in ours. He saw their faith and God used their, that, the, the faith of this circle to help this man. Let's keep going. So everybody needs a circle. It's point number one. Hope you wrote it down. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, this is right after Jesus said, friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the, law, of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy? Who can forgive sins but God alone? Good question. And the answer is no one. They just didn't re realize who Jesus was. Jesus knew what they were thinking. It's always dangerous to have thoughts when you're around Jesus because you can't hide anything. Why, or not are you saying these things, why are you thinking these things in your heart? You're like, whoa, this just got weird. Which is easier to say? Your sins are forgiven or to say, get up and walk? Uh, both are extremely challenging, I would say. But Jesus said, but I want you to know that the Son of Man, me, Jesus Christ, has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. Unbelievable. These men came hoping Jesus could help their friend walk. Hoping they could, that Jesus could heal because they had heard that Jesus healed physical conditions. But Jesus had a much bigger miracle in mind and he gave the man both. Here's the thing is in this series called Everybody, Everybody Needs a Circle, but everybody needs a miracle. 
Everybody needs the miracle. It's the heart of the gospel, right? Jesus didn't come to give us what we wanted. He came to give us what we needed. And all of us, right, are more like this paralyzed man than we even think. All of us made in the image of God, but all of us uh, separated, broken because of our sin, right? Falling short of God's standard perfection. And all of us in need of a savior, in need of grace, in need of of a miracle. And Jesus knew that. So he came to announce to the world, it's not about getting what you want just on earth, but it's a what you need forever. And his miracle was infinitely more valuable than these men could even realize. If, if you're uh, watching on your phone or you got your Bible in front of you, turn to Leviticus um, yeah, that's right. I'm going to Leviticus, people. Don't worry. I know you've been, your devotions have been there and you've got a lot of notes from them. Leviticus 21. I just, every day, just wake up and read more of Leviticus so I can, um, no, no comment. Now I'm really struggling on this broadcast. Hold on one second. I cannot get these two pages separated in my Bible. There, this is amazing. This is so embarrassing, Brad. Verse 16 of Leviticus 21. It's given instructions for the priest and how to do the, the sacrifices in the Old Testament, how to approach the temple of God, the, the presence of God on earth. And he says, the Lord says to Moses, say to Aaron, for the generations to come, none of your descendants, none of the priestly, gener uh, the priestly family, who has a defect may come near to offer the food of his God. No man who has any defect may come near. No man who is blind or lame, disfigured or deformed. No man with a crippled foot or a hand who is a hunchback or a dwarf, any eye defect who has festering and running sores. This is a really encouraging verse, right? Um, he says, no descendant of Aaron the priest who has any defect is to come near to present the food offerings to the Lord. He is a defect. He must not come near to offer the food of his God. He may eat the holy food as well as uh, of his God, as well as the holy food. Yet because of his defect, he must not go near the curtain or approach the altar and so desecrate my sanctuary. I am the Lord who makes him holy. And this is why some of us don't read Leviticus. You're like, what does that even mean? Well, one, in the Old Testament, it was also about God establishing the standard for which we could approach a holy God. And the, the Ten Commandments and the laws, right, were to prove our need for a Savior. Like I said, all of us have more in common this, with this man than we think because we've all fallen short. And all of the Old Testament is about, uh, not all of it, but most of it is about God establishing this standard of holiness, announcing to the world, you have to be perfect to come into my presence. But obviously that's not possible for anybody. But so he sent Jesus to make a way for every single one of us. I want you to think about what's happening. All these people thought you, you can't come near to God, the presence of God, if you got a defect. But now on the floor in front of Jesus, not in front of the altar, in front of the person of Jesus, God in the flesh is this man. And Jesus didn't say, get away from me, get away from me, get away from me. You can't have anything to do with me. I can't be near you. I can't touch you. You'll make me unclean. I'm too good for you. Why are you here? Why did you interrupt me? None of that. He, he, says, uh, he says back to Luke 5, he says, friend. His friends lay him at his feet. He says, he's friend. Or in other accounts, they said it was son, but either way, it was a term of affection. A term of I, I care about you. I love you. It was a, a term of grace. It was a, a term of compassion. I want you to know if you, you don't think you can come near to Jesus, you're not good enough. You've done too much. You've been too many wrong places. You, you've messed up too many times. You have too many questions, too many doubts. And you would never be received by Jesus or the people of God. When you come close, right, he will, he will speak to you with affection, with compassion, he said he didn't come to, to condemn the world, but to save the world. 
And he, he longs for you to draw near so he can put his arms around you and say, I love you. I forgive you, son, daughter. Your, your sins are forgiven. The slate has been wiped clean. You've been made whole, made new. For me, remembering that everybody needs a miracle is also remembering that my opportunity or my role is not just to change people's behaviors. Because again, I, I, I love this passage and I wanna be somebody that's carrying a corner to get people to Jesus. But if I'm not careful, I try to carry my corner to get somebody to change their behavior or to just actually honestly get them to go to church. But I, I have to have this mindset. I wanna get them all the way to Jesus having an encounter with Jesus, having a relationship with Jesus, walking with Jesus. Parents, if you're out there, you, you might be so consumed with getting your kid into the right school, the right college, and that's not a bad goal, right? But don't let it be more important than getting your child, your son, your daughter, all the way to Jesus. You might have a, a, a husband, a spouse, you're so, um, you've got so much thoughts about helping them get the right job or getting the right place in the right city. Yes, that can be important, but don't put it above getting them all the way to Jesus. Your friends, right? You don't just, don't make it an idol of making sure they're in community. Make sure they walk with God. Get them all the way to Jesus. I remember I, in, in high school, I, I played tennis. It was one of the sports that I played and there was, I was a freshman. There was a bunch of juniors and seniors that were really good, but they were also running the party crowd at our high school. And I had a, I had a strong group of Jesus followers that I was very close to through church growing up. West Texas, shout out to all the Texans out there. If you speak at Passion City, DC, you have to mention Texas or Texas A&M at some point. It's just kind of like part of the deal. But I had a strong group of friends um, that helped me be all that God wanted me to be. I had a great circle, but then I also had an opportunity with the tennis team. And, and these guys respected my faith. They didn't try to talk me in uh, to do all, all the things that they did, but they, they were running the scene. And I was like, man, this is my chance. I'm gonna carry those dudes to Jesus. I'm gonna carry my corner. I don't need three other guys. I'm gonna do this on my own. But it, I actually, my, my faith was a little too small. I remember um, one day, uh, that one of the guys that was junior played basketball and he was on the varsity team and he came and he's like, man, today's workout was really, really hard. We had to time ourselves in a mile and I, you know, it was, it was exhausting and everybody's trying their hardest. And I was like, well, what was the fastest time? He was like 620 or 612, I can't remember. And I was like, I was on the freshman team. We were gonna do it later that week. And I was like, man, I wonder if I could, I don't know, get under a six minute mile. I've never like timed myself. I don't know. He's like, there is no way that you will beat anybody on the varsity team in that mile. And I was like, well, let's place a bet. I guess it's a bad way to get your friends to Jesus, right? But I'm like, if I run under a six minute mile, you, this guy's a notorious dipper. He always had a little bit of tobacco in his mouth. I'm like, you have to quit dipping for the whole semester. And he was like, done. And I was like, well, one, there was nothing I had to give up. So why'd you even make that bet in the first, first place? But um, and I didn't know what day we were going to run it. The funniest part is that it was right after lunch. I went and had a huge burger at lunch and had, I remember onions, pickles, way too much information, right? But I had this massive lunch and then we show up to the workout and the coach is like, hey, today we're going to see how fast we can run a mile. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this guy's life is dependent on me running this mile. And I am full as I can be, but I'm going to give it my all. I'm going to sprint this thing as fast as I can because I'm going to get this guy well, not all the way to Jesus, but to stop dipping. And sure enough, I think I did like 549. I know, applaud me, say I'm amazing. Make sure you Instagram at that, mention it in the chat, no matter what. But anyway, I, I, I crossed the finish line, heard the time, and then I threw up all over the place. And my lunch was right there back in front of me. But I thought I was a big deal. And the stories were being told about my mile, right? And the bet. And it was all fun and good, but Again, I was more worried about his behavior than his heart. His outward appearance of following the rules, doing the right thing, the Christian thing, right? Versus I want to get him all the way to Jesus. Everybody needs a miracle. Everybody is dead in their transgressions and sins until that moment where Jesus gives them life that only comes through his name. So let's remember that our cities, our friend groups, our 
coworkers, our siblings, our parents, our world. People need Jesus. They need to hear from their savior, friend, son, daughter, your sins are forgiven. You've been released from the condemnation of your sin. Your slate has been wiped clean. You're, uh, you've been washed as white as snow. The, these men had faith. I, God did more than they could even ask or imagine. And then I'll just finish up with this. Immediately, the man stood up in front of them, took what he'd been lying on, and went home praising God. Of course he did. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. Everyone needs a circle. Everyone needs a miracle, but also everyone needs a ministry. You need a ministry. This is the plan, right? There's a group of people, they said they saw amazing things, remarkable things that said everybody did. Everybody saw remarkable things, but only a few participated. And, and then everyone else had the chance right in that moment. I don't know what happened, but hopefully they went and found a mat to bring more people to Jesus. They thought about people in their world because they saw what Jesus could do. Now they were on the hook. So it was their turn to go and t tell the world about this man named Jesus. That day, four men with their friend and Jesus participated in the miracle. But all of us have this opportunity now that we know once we've received the grace of God, once we've been washed by his blood, then we can then go announce to the world, our world, who Jesus is and what he can do for people's lives. You need a ministry. You need, you need to go find opportunities to carry mats, right? To help more people know Jesus. I, I love it. This guy picked up his mat, went home. Now he didn't need the mat anymore but he could use that mat for somebody else. God's freed you from something, saved you from something, healed you from something, set you, set you alive and, and, and broke some chains of uh, something in your life. You could use that very mat that he freed you from, picked you up from to go and help people on a mat like you were on. Of course, this guy didn't, I, I, I can't imagine went around and saw other people that are paralyzed and was like, ha ha, I got my mat. You're still on yours, huh? Hmm. Wish you had friends like me. Wish you had a circle like me. I hope he said, okay, I can walk now. I've, I've been healed spiritually and physically. So I, bro, you got to meet who I met. You got to go through the roof. Like I went through the roof. I'm going to be one of those friends that digs the hole for you. This is the heart of the gospel. This is the everybody mentality of the church, right? If you, if you read through Acts, you'll see a word early on in the early church and it's the word all. It was a beautiful description of the life of the early church. It wasn't just a few of the, the really spiritual people that had it all together, the, the disciples, if you will, the, the 12 apostles. It wasn't just the pastors and the worship leaders and the staff. It was all. They were all participating in the building up of the church and the advancing and the announcing of the gospel. They were all sacrificing. They were all giving. They were all gathering. This is God's heart that everybody would have a ministry. He wouldn't just use a few, but he would use everybody, including you. But I want you to think a little bit more because there were some people there that were obstacles. Go back to verse 17, one day, that's where we started. One day Jesus was teaching and Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. And we know as Luke continues to write, that is not just a description of their physical action, but it was alluding to the fact that there were people in the crowd that were physical obstacles to this man meeting Jesus. The, the, the four guys had to work around a crowd. And it, it says that there were just people, so many people sitting there, consumed with having the best seat, hearing for themselves, right? Making sure they got what they wanted for that day. 
They, they missed the fact that there was a paralyzed man and that the Lord's power was on Jesus to heal in that moment. So if you really knew what was happening, you're like, I'm, I got a good seat, but that guy needs to get healed and only Jesus can heal him. So I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna give up my seat. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get out of the way. I'm not gonna make it just all of church all about me. I'm not gonna be consumed with just hearing another sermon. And that comes from a preacher that likes to preach, right? But I don't want us to, I don't want us to have a church that we're just defined by where we were sitting there. We can't just sit there when we know that the power of the Lord, the power of God is on Jesus to heal and there's brokenness, there's pain, there is loss, there is punishment, there is judgment coming on the world, right? We can't just sit there when we have this ministry, right? In 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about them, the ministry of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ ambassadors. God's making his appeal to the world, yeah, to the world, that there is love, there's forgiveness, there is freedom, there is eternity. He's making that appeal to the world through you, through us, through the church. And sadly, too many of us are obstacles. I know I'm at the edge of the stage and I don't want to step on your own, your toes too much. Or I, I don't want, but I'm going to be stepping on my own. I think the way that we live our lives, many Christians becomes an obstacle to people following Jesus because they see what we say about God doesn't match how we live for God. So why would they want what we have? When we say one thing but live a different way or treat people a different way that doesn't match with the faith that we confess, then if you, if you were a thinking person and the, the people of God that you knew didn't live a life that matched up to the faith, right, then and, and, and yes, there's grace and yes, we're all broken. And that's why this gospel is beautiful because we're only announcing to the world, Jesus is perfect, not us. But that doesn't mean that just gives us a license to sin and do whatever we want and just act like the world and expect the world to wanna follow Jesus. Because once we receive this miracle and encounter Jesus, he begins to change us, right? And as he changes us, that becomes our ministry, the way he uses us to announce to the world, there's, the pow there's power in the gospel, not just for the, the future life of eternity, get out of hell, you know, stamp your past to heaven card, but no, there's power right now. This man got spiritual forever healing. He also got physical healing. There's, pr there's, there's power for your life today to walk in freedom to be, um, you know, be set free from the things that hold you back. Just God wants to start changing you and me. And as he changes us, people will notice and they'll want what we have. This is our ministry. God wants to make his appeal to the world through us, not just for us to sit there. I know we're not in buildings right now, but our hope at Passion City Church is to have a group of people, right, that aren't just so consumed on whether we like the worship set, whether or not the preacher made us laugh, ma making sure we had the good seat, but hopefully for every single person, all, everybody, at occasionally, often, once a year, more. It wouldn't just be you and me sitting in the same seats by ourselves every week but that we could look around and be like, oh, who's the new person with them? Who's, who, who'd they bring this time? Because this is, right, if, if we knew what was, if you, we were in that crowd that day and, and we, we hear there's a paralyzed man, maybe we didn't get, catch on it early enough, but then all of a sudden we see these guys start digging a hole in the roof. You're like, okay, hey, something's about to go down. I want in on this, get, give me a rope. I will catch him. I will, I, I, I'm not one of the four guys that carried the mat, but, I can do something to get this guy to Jesus. This has got to be our heart. It can't be just to sit there. I'll end with this. Um, there are so many beautiful stories through our church in the last 10 years of different people who have really embodied the faith that these men had. But one of them is a student that 
I've walked closely with, and he went on to play college football across the country. He's big, uh, tight end, 6'5", 280 pounds, something like that. I don't have his bio memorized, but he's a big dude about my size, right? No, I'm kidding. And he, he had his life change at a, a weekend that we did for our high school students. Went off to college, but when he was in college, he didn't just jump into what everybody else was doing. He also didn't get so consumed with his craft, his profession, his um, skill, right? But every year he would, he would pay his own way to come back to this weekend to serve as a leader. But not only that, he would call me a few weeks before and he'd be like, hey, Brad, I need you to save me a few spots. Uh, I'm gonna bring some people with me. I'm like, cool, yeah, happy to help get them signed up. Like, what are their names? And he's like, I don't know yet. I was like, okay, it's a little bit hard for me to save spots for kids that I don't even know if they're gonna come. He's like, well, just, just trust me, save me a few spots. And the first year I was a little bit hesitant, but the next year I knew what happened because basically he'd come, he'd come home on a Friday. The event started that Friday night. He would just go to his high school and to the juniors and seniors that, of the current day. And he would just knock on their front door. Hey man, we're about to go to a winter weekend. You're coming with me, Let, let's go. And um, again, he's six five and he's a, a force, right? So most kids are like, Sir, yes, sir, let's go. And he, there, there was even one moment, I'm like, bro, the bus is about to leave. He's like, hey, <laughs> there's, a, there's this kid I really wanna come, I'm really believing for, he really needs this. He's been going through a hard time. He's mentally in a really hard spot. He doesn't wanna come. Can you hold the buses? Because he's, um, I'm with his dad, he's locked in the bathroom and he's not sure if he's ready to come or not, but can you just hold the bus? And I'm like, bro, this is, I mean, actually you might, this might be a restraining order for you. Like, you know, be careful. But it was this mentality of everybody. God wants to use everybody. And he was gonna go to whatever means was necessary. He was gonna climb the stairs and dig a hole through the roof. He wasn't gonna take no for an answer, not because it was gonna make him look impressive, but because the power of, of God was on Jesus to heal souls. And Jesus in his grace is inviting you to be a part of this family, everybody, right? And then in that everybody be a part of the ministry through which he brings the world to himself. And there will be sacrifice, there will be um, work involved, there will be effort, right? But in the end of the day, it won't be in vain, it will be worth it. We might not see the results this side of heaven, we might not see them for a few years, but at the end of the day, no matter what, when we start carrying a mat because we know our friends need Jesus, then we will be grateful that we gave our life for what matters most.